Hello class, Professor Vanderville here. Today, what we're gonna talk about uh, in this lecture uh, is the one, one of the few shining lights or positive things to happen in the Gilded Age, and that's public education. During the Gilded Age, public education is really gonna shine and improve dramatically and it's gonna be one of the few great things that happens during the Gilded Age. So, what will start this uh, ball of rolling as far as public education goes, is in the 1870s, states started to adopt uh, compulsory education laws. Now what a compulsory education law is, is the law that requires you to send your child to public school till a certain age. Now previously, before the 1870s, public education in America, which started really in the 1820s in the state of Massachusetts under the leadership of Horace Mann, basically provided America's children with a education from kindergarten to eighth grade, and that's where it ended. If you wanted to go on to high school, high schools were all private and tuition-bearing institutions. And then obviously, if you wanted to go on to college, your parents had to have the ability to pay tuition to send you to college in addition. So uh, eighth grade was about the extent of most Americans' educations. But then in the 1870s, states started to require children to go beyond the eighth grade. They started requiring children to attend school to age uh, 15, 16, and so forth. Uh, like today, most states require students to uh, attend public school until at least the age of 16. Many states recently have adopted laws requiring students to go to school till the age of 18. So, when you require students com with compulsory ed laws to go to a later age, you have to supply them with that education. So basically what these compulsory ed laws did by the 1880s is create public high schools in America, which hadn't existed before. As I mentioned, they were private tuition-bearing institutions. So, to give you an idea of this rise in high schools in America, in 1870, there were only 160 high schools in the entire nation. By the turn of the century, in 1900, there were 6,000 high schools in America and the overwhelming majority of them were public high schools, <clears throat> where the 160 in 1870 were private. So this is a huge change, and it means we're going to have a tremendous amount of high school graduates also, which we'll be talking about their effect on higher education here in a few minutes. But uh, along with this tremendous increase in public high schools, a tremendous increase in spending on public education occurred. And what's gonna happen is we're gonna see uh, the spending on public education. Now, these numbers seem ridiculously low, but it's the value of money and so forth because uh, New York State spends approximately, I, think, I believe, $6 billion on K-12 through education. But uh, if you combined all public uh, uh, education budgets in 1870, when there were no public high schools, they added up to $63 million total. By the turn of the century, when you add all those public high schools that we mentioned before, the total budgets of the states spent on public education went up to 253 million. So uh, as you can see, uh, spending on public high schools quadrupled during this time period also. 
Now, uh, when you uh, have this tremendous increase in spending, states are going to start to basically, as the saying goes, make sure they're getting the bang for the buck, so to speak. And because they institute, you know, most of the spending is devoted towards public high schools, they're going to want uh, especially high school teachers to be credentialed, meaning they would have to go uh, to uh, a higher education institution and uh, receive a degree in education and then be credentialed by the state. <clears throat> we take all that for granted, but before, when you just had basically the states providing an eighth grade education, teachers didn't even have to go to college to be a teacher. They could be like apprentice teachers and teach under uh, an experienced teacher for a few years, then be teaching on their own. And remember, these were the days also uh, in rural areas with one-room schoolhouses. Many of you probably either read or watched the series Little House on the Prairie, and you might remember that's how Laura becomes a teacher. She's a top student. Her teacher takes her under her wing, trains her for a few years, and pretty soon she's on her own. That was the norm back then. So uh, because of this demand by the states, teacher training schools started to pop up all over the place. Now, back in this day and age, a teacher's training school was known as a normal school. <clears throat> now, uh, to give you an idea of the tremendous increase in demand for certified or credentialed teachers, in 1860, in the entire country, there were only 12 normal schools or teaching schools in existence. By the time we get to 1910, there are 300 schools that are either strictly devoted to public ed as normal schools or universities who have taken on those programs. A tremendous increase. <clears throat> now, I know the term normal school sounds kind of crazy, I wasn't familiar with it until I went to college. And the reason why I was from, became familiar with it is uh, as an undergraduate, I went to Eastern Michigan University. Eastern Michigan University was founded in 1849, and it was originally known as the Michigan Normal School. <clears throat> now, I still didn't really know what a normal school was, but I can remember one day I was with a friend of mine and she was a education major and she had to go meet with her advisor. So I went with her and waited outside the building where she went in while she met because we we're doing something afterwards. And I'm sitting out there uh, on campus on a nice day uh, looking around and I noticed that the building that she went in to meet with her advisor, where I'd never had any classes because I wasn't an ed major, <clears throat> above the archway to the main entrance, it said Michigan Normal School. And it was one of the oldest buildings on campus. I knew that from being a history major. So when she came out, I asked her, uh, why is that called Michigan Normal School? And she said, you dummy. That's what they used to call teacher education institutions uh, before they became universities. So Eastern Michigan was Michigan Normal School, one of the 12 original normal schools, in fact. Now, all of you are probably well aware of a normal school, but you may not know it. Plattsburgh State University, when it opened in the 1870s, opened as Plattsburgh Normal School not Plattsburgh State University or SUNY Plattsburgh. <clears throat> and the original building that said Plattsburgh Normal School on it, unfortunately was tore down and replaced with the very tall building on campus where all the administrators are housed and you pay your bills and whatnot, Keyhole. 
So, unfortunately, they tore down the oldest building on campus and built that uh, monstrosity, but that's another story. So, we've got uh, the advent of this demand for teachers, which creates normal schools, and then also now with this, the advent of so many high school graduates, there's going to be a much greater demand for higher education, especially public higher education. So besides compulsory ed laws having such a tremendous impact on public education in America, uh, the other thing that will have a tremendous uh, impact on public ed is a law passed by Congress in 1862, and the name of that law is the Moral Land Grant Act. Now, in my opinion, the Moral Land Grant Act is one of the two most important laws ever passed in American history. The other would be uh, the GI Bill or the Servicemen's Readjustment Act, as it was officially known, passed in 1944, which uh, took care of the 15 million returning World War II veterans, which we'll talk about at a later point. But the Morrill Land Grant Act passed in 1862 is a significant law. Now, Morrill is spelled M-O-R-R-I-L-L. -L. It's not your morals. It's a gentleman. And it's the name of a senator from the state of Vermont, Justin Morrill, who wrote this law and pushed it through Congress. So, Here's how it worked. Back in this day and age, the federal government was in basically the business of giving away federal land, especially the large tracts of federal land that existed out west after the Louisiana Purchase, the Mexican-American War, and uh, all the other land grabs that took place out west. Uh, we really didn't get into it in much detail, but they were giving away tremendous amounts of land to the railroads so they could build all the railroads out west. Some they directly subsidized, some they did it through land grants, uh, and they gave away millions of acres to the railroads. Uh, they were giving away land to homesteaders, who we'll talk about later on. Uh, they were giving away land to mining companies, to cattle ranchers, you name it. So this isn't out of the ordinary, and this is how they're going to fund the construction of public universities. So here's how it works. <clears throat> if you wanted, as a state, to build a public university, you would apply to the federal government through the Moral Land Grant Act, and they would grant you a huge tract of federal land. Now, if there was federal land available in your state, they'd give you land right in your state. If you were a state in the east where it was developed and there wasn't many tracts of federal land to give away, they'd give you a huge tract out west. Then what the state could do with it, if the land was in their state, they'd use part of it to construct their public university on it. If the land was out west, they would sell the land, use the proceeds to construct the public university. They'd do the same if the land was contained within that state in particular. Sell part, keep part. <clears throat> now, there was a couple purposes to this that uh, Senator Justin Morrill wanted to see happen because he was from the rural state of Vermont. He wanted these brand new public universities to have uh, two programs in particular. Programs in agricultural studies be to help out farmers develop new techniques, farming techniques, seeds, so forth, and in what was known back then as the mechanical sciences which today we call engineering. So they had to have big programs in agriculture, big programs in engineering. 
Now, the other big thing, and to me, this makes this law the most important of all. <clears throat> Women had to be allowed to attend any public university that was built with moral land grant uh, land and money. Before this, women weren't allowed to attend universities across America. Most of them are private. Private universities were all all-male institutions. There were a handful of all-female institutions like Vassar, that you probably heard of, now it's co-ed, Smith, Radcliffe, but there was just a handful. This opens up higher education to women in America, which is huge. It's one of the things that's gonna make the women's uh, rights movement catch so much steam, not that they're gaining college educations, and really allows women to take their rightful place in society. Now, because of the Moral Land Grant Act, over its existence, over the next few decades, 69 public universities will be constructed using this law all across the country. Now, some of them you should be familiar with. You might not realize that they're moral land grant institutions. One's right across the pond from us, University of Vermont. Makes sense. Justin Morrill, senator who came up with this idea, University of Vermont, was one of the first. In our great state of New York, Cornell University is a moral land grant institution. That's why Cornell to this day still has huge agricultural programs, <clears throat> has a great veterinary science program, and obviously has engineering programs. If you've ever been to Cornell, you know that the experimental fields for their uh, agriculture and horticultural programs are basically the size of the city of Plattsburgh. So those are two that you may be familiar with. I'll, I'll mention a few others. Many of these uh, universities that are in the so-called Big Ten are moral land grant institutions. University of Wisconsin, the University of Minnesota, University of Illinois, and Michigan State University uh, is a moral land grant institution. I'm pretty familiar with Michigan State University. Many of my friends went there. My nephew went there. My uncle went there. <clears throat> it has huge uh, agricultural programs and also has uh, every engineering program that you can think of. But one thing that it's um, maybe most famous for is its top-notch veterinary science program. Uh, the veterinary hospital at the University of Michigan is twice the size of CVPH. And it's a state-of-the-art institution. And if you have a pet that something horrible happens to it, this happened to my parents with their pet English Bulldog, they had to rush him to Michigan State Veterinary Hospital and they miraculously saved their dog's life. And I know many other people have rushed their pets over to East Lansing uh, to go to the old Moral Land Grant Institution to save their pets' lives. Now, uh, one other university worth mentioning, uh, Cal State Berkeley, another land grant institution. So, uh, universities will really be on the rise. Women will take their rightful place in colleges and universities thanks to this great act. And America will really start to take the lead in the world in the area of having an educated population. Now, a couple of other things I would mention in the education realm that happened in the Gilded Age were that were positive. <clears throat> the education of African Americans. We already talked about some of the work of the Freedmen's Bureau and their great leader, General Howard, who then goes on to found Howard University, arguably the greatest uh, all-black uh, college and university in the United States. And uh, <clears throat> 
The Freedmen's Bureau and Freedmen's Schools will educate a tremendous amount of the emancipated slaves. <clears throat> now, there'll be some other uh, great breakthroughs as far as African-American education goes, and that's going to be the subject of my next lecture. In my next lecture, I'm going to talk to you about two great African-American uh, education reformers, and those two uh, gentlemen are Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. Du Bois. So I'm going to take a break, get a drink of water, and I'll be back to talk to you about two great education pillars of society. So take care. I'll see you soon.